You are watching World Insight with me, Tian Wei. Still to come on the program. What Confucius says about uncertainty and changes in today's world. Renowned Professor Chu Wenming weighs in right after this. Welcome back. You're watching World Insight. I'm Tian Wei. With unilateralism on the rise, the debate over globalization is front and center. To make heads and tails of great uncertainty and looming conflict, we turn to philosophy and history. Back in China's Warring States period of time, before the Qin Dynasty, all sorts of thoughts battled for dominance. Confucianism then was the idea whose time has come. Fast forward to modern times in a way more complex world. Could ancient Chinese philosophy help shed some light? There's no better person to answer that question than Professor Chu Weiming, one of the most well-known Confucian thinkers in centuries. When it comes to comparing Chinese philosophy with Western philosophy, Professor Chu is talking about China as an ancient living civilization. I'm suggesting that uh, the current chaos, as compared with the uh, Warren States period, magnified by a thousand times global disorder, not to mention the uh, the climate change, the environmental de uh, degradation, and now the incredible development of science, which may lead to the whole question of redefining humanity. So all these are major chaotic forces and diversity is even greater. The uh, uh, technologies, especially in uh, science and communication, has enabled the uh, global community right. to become a global village. And this is, uh, in a way, our misfortune because uh, the village is noted for tension, conflict, and contradiction, but it is also the great fortune for the humans to think for the first time in right. human history as a community. But here comes the question, Professor Tu. Yes. That is, China has already become the second largest economy in the world. Right. At least in the number. Right. Secondly, people are looking at China right. and say, what can you offer? Right. Besides money. Right. Cash. Right. Infrastructure. Right. What about ideas? Right. Very deep in my, uh, in my heart and in terms of my own self-reflection, it's not simply arrogance or simply wishful thinking. I do, do believe within Chinese culture, uh, within the, especially the spiritual um, aspects of Chinese culture, there are a lot of resources that can very well be mobilized mm -hmm. and enhance our understanding of the human. Uh, for example, one of the ideas uh, in the Confucian tradition is that from the emperor to the commoner, each should regard self-cultivation as the root. The idea of self-cultivation is each human being, despite uh, ethnicity, gender, and so forth, ought to first ask the question introspectively. Mm. Uh, how, how can I be a reasonable human being? How can I be friendly to others? This idea of self-improvement, self-understanding, mm. starting from uh, each individual, is a rich resource for the human community. We are not seeing many of the great examples yes. of so-called self-cultivation, as you just mentioned. <laughs> so people yeah. will say, Professor, probably your thought is out of date. Uh, it's still happening. The exceptional case indicates how precious this idea, it is not just Confucian, it is in right. the Christian, in the Islamic, in Hindu, all the traditions. Yes. You, if you want to understand yourself, you should first of all, very serious about self-cultivation about self-reflection. Uh, this is uh, a resource that every human being has. It is not that going to be demonstrated by the leaders. Uh, many of the leaders seem to have lost their way <laughs> and uh, because they be become political animals. Mm -hmm. They are no longer human in the genuine sense of the term. Mm -hmm. And so this is only part of the story. The other one is how to deal with another person. Uh, the principle of do not do to others what you would not want others to do to you. It's a golden rule in the negative is to say the minimum requirement for human interaction mm. is to see to it the other 
receive not only your recognition but your respect and you try to be public spirited uh, not just a privatized ego but also an open dynamic interchange uh, person so I think in a way that is uh, despite the challenge you just mentioned I think it's real it's very serious and uh, self-cultivation as a way of life is very widely uh, mm -hmm. accepted. Professor Chu, as you may know, these days when people talk about China or the right. Chinese in general, they are saying, so these are smart people. Right. They are rich, or mm -hmm. at least they are getting richer. Mm -hmm. And it seems that in a few decades they are going to leave all of us behind. Mm -hmm. Well, they are going to be the group that's going to benefit the mm -hmm. development of the world. Mm -hmm. And that is interesting phenomenon because mm -hmm. You've been advocating, Professor Chu, mm -hmm. self-cultivation, mm -hmm. which in certain cases could mean mm -hmm. the communications mm -hmm. are not efficient. Right. Mm -hmm. Because people tend to look inside mm -hmm. more self-cultivation mm -hmm. rather than increase the capability of communicating with others of exactly what your egos mm -hmm. and your desires are. Yes. And that could lead to miscommunication, mm -hmm. misunderstanding, yeah. and probably even bigger problems. Yeah. How do you see the balance of these two? Mm -hmm. Actually, a person uh, is always understood as a center of relationships. It's not possible to think about a person as an isolated individual. It's not an island. So subjectivity in this connection is also intersubjectivity. Your ability to think in terms of uh, the others. Uh, the, the others becomes not only uh, recognized, respected, but the dignity of the other is an end in itself rather mm. than just a means to an end. So reciprocity in the um, classical sense of the term is even among um, family members, mm. uh, the father, son, husband and wife, and uh, older and younger siblings, uh, the relationship is always reciprocal because you have to exercise the value of considerateness. If you do not do that, uh, that will haunt you. Right. And you will not be able to, uh, to really sustain with your own one-dimensional approach uh, to uh, express your egoistic concerns. It's not uh, your private person, mm -hmm. but how you understand yourself as a, a relationship in reference to many other people with uh, many other uh, aspirations. Mm. But this is what also people have been talking about. Yes. These days it's not about who is having the dignity, mm -hmm. who is having this moral high ground, yes. but rather who is going to be the winner. Mm -hmm. uh, this is of course uh, Hobbes' idea, all human beings uh, involved in a kind of uh, zero-sum game uh, is very common and this is going to continue. But there are underlying rules that allow even this level of communication to happen. Like Otherwise, what? there's no communication. Like now, what? I have to say, even though we're not in a dialogical civilization, you know, we're in a conflictual civilization, but the word dialogue uh, actually occurs all the time, at all levels, even military confrontation. China and the United States are involving a military dialogue in order to avoid some unintended negative consequences. Mm. Now, this is, of course, a very bad example, in other words, minimum condition. And yet, for any society to survive, not to mention the global community, mm. certain kind of rules of the game, certain kind of uh, etiquette, uh, certain kind of consideration will have to be there in order for the, the world to continue. Otherwise, uh, there's no even communication possible than a long dialogue. Philosopher Professor Tu Weiming was born in Kunming, Yunnan province in the 1940s. He grew up in Taiwan and later studied and taught in several world-renowned institutes in the United States. Almost a decade ago, he came back to the Chinese mainland where he's been doing humanitarian and also humanistic research ever since based on his vast experience at home and abroad, and from an insider and outsider's perspective, how does he see China's reform and opening up over the past four decades? Take a look. Uh, for 40 years, reform and opening up, China getting richer, mm -hmm. and China getting much more respected than it used to be. But mm -hmm. at the same time, there are daunting tasks in front of China, yes. still, mm -hmm. probably even more. Mm -hmm. 
as they say, the reform has been going into the so-called deep water zone. Right. Is there something from China's ancient philosophy mm -hmm. or its modern version mm -hmm. will be able to help lead the way? Oh, absolutely. I think uh, one very important idea is that China, in terms of collectively, our Chinese economy is the second. But uh, per capita, um, the Chinese situation is still quite uh, uh, miserable. Mm. And uh, probably 100, 100 million people are still uh, um, um, classified as uh, abject poverty. So what, how China would develop, first of all, a sense of uh, equity, a sense of uh, mutual responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, each person's dignity has to be respected. And the people who are poor will have to be helped. And because uh, the, the gap between the rich and poor in China is very serious, 10%, 90% or so. Yeah. And it is in this situation that China need to rethink the five basic values within its own tradition. Like what? The first one is uh, a sense of humanity, a sense of uh, human heartedness, sympathy, empathy. The other one is uh, justice, not just, uh, not just freedom, but also justice. Uh, and of course, uh, civility. Mm -hmm. uh, civility, which, which is really the lacking uh, sometimes even in ordinary human existence. Uh, and wisdom, uh, not just accumulation of knowledge, but also um, wisdom and uh, the idea to reflect upon one, oneself uh, all the time. And very important feature is trust. Mm -hmm. And we really, as compared with, uh, say, Japan, uh, with uh, Europe, and the trust is quite uh, deficient in China. This kind of spiritual, ethical resources are absolutely critical for sustaining not just wealth and power, but also basic uh, equality and uh, even basic peace and stability. And that people basically agree. The idea is that you teach your children, and hopefully your children will be able to put them into practice, are really the ideas that we need to ask you know, Chinese parents, uh, Chinese leaders, Chinese entrepreneurs, successful Chinese, to think about them. But many say, Professor, yes. there is a fine balance between the vitality of social debate right. and the stability and the efficiency yes. of a society. Right. How is that being reflected in today's China? Mm -hmm. What is that fine balance? Right. I think uh, there's a lot of debate, there's a lot of discussion, uh, through the internet, through the which are and all kinds of other facilities, but that's not public debate. Uh, basically, reaction to a particular incident, uh, to a particular situation that people don't like, and there's a great deal of uproar, mm. and this is upsurge of certain kind of anger, frustration, and this is not debate. How do we channel that mechanism? The mechanism is there, and uh, allowing. Uh, reasonable ideas to be expressed. Mm. Uh, not only allowing reasonable ideas to be expressed, allowing certain kind of critical spirit to be cultivated. This critical spirit, uh, self-cultivation actually means you'll be able to criticize yourself. It's very important not to develop a certain kind of uh, uh, self-congratulatory uh, notion about your greatness uh, because you certainly feel that uh, you're rich enough to be able to outsmart others. And this is uh, uh, the, the idea of humbleness, humility, is very, very critical for the Chinese community as a whole. Professor Tu, before we go, several important words that mm -hmm. I would like to share with you. For mm -hmm. example, confidence. Mm -hmm. How confidence is being built, reflected, but at the same time make sure it is not going to become a force of self-satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Confidence and humbleness, right. this right balance. Right. Confidence and arrogance are really in conflict. Confidence is based upon inner strength. And again, I return to the idea of cultivation. The cultivation is uh, a way of understanding who, who I am. And even though I fail to perform well in some other areas, but there's always the possibility of uh, recharge the, mm -hmm. uh, the energy. But uh, also recognize this is not my privilege. This is my responsibility. Uh, many other people deserve the same kind of respect. Mm. And therefore, 
how you'll be able to learn the best from all over the world. Uh, at the same time, you have some confidence that your direction is correct. Hmm. Uh, these two are interconnected. Uh, if they are separate, then uh, you lose not only your own confidence, uh, but also your ability to continue to learn and relearn. Professor Tu, last but not least, mm -hmm. in Confucianism, right. one of the most important thing is to make sure that mm -hmm. people aspire to become a noble person. Right. Jun Zi. Mm -hmm. Now, today's world, mm -hmm. what are some of the most important qualities mm -hmm. if you call someone a Jun Zi, mm -hmm. a noble person, mm -hmm. or a people, mm -hmm. a noble people? And uh, first of all, it is a sense a uh, person with dignity. Commander of the three armies can be snatched away. The will of a commander cannot be snatched away. If you will that uh, no matter at what kind of political or social uh, stratification, you want to be a person that you, sh uh, you feel not only comfortable with, but proud. And you want to be the best kind of person you want to become. Uh, this is the idea of learning to be human. And to uh, Lu Xiangshan talk about to establish that which is great in us. Mm -hmm. Every human being, uh, man, woman, old and young and so forth, all have the will that I want to be a better human being. And I want to be a better human being not as an isolated individual. It's against uh, uh, extreme form of uh, individualism. I want to be a human being uh, because I can communicate fruitfully, meaningfully, to other human beings. Yes. And we can uh, grow and flourish together. Professor Tu, what a pleasure talking to you. I learned so much today. Thank you so much, sir, for being with us. Thank you very much. Really I appreciate, appreciate it. it. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. Professor Tu Wei Ming, a philosopher and certainly one of those representative figures of so-called New Confucianism. And that is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us, World Insights CGTN, into your search engine or check out our YouTube channel. You can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Sina Weibo. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone on the World Insight team, thanks for watching. And tune in again next time for insights across China and around the world. And it's the end of the work week. Enjoy your weekend. See you back here on Monday. Bye for now.